Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. Got my robe on here. We're looking at the Supreme Court. I am Mr. Beats. Thank you for being here. I especially want to give a shout out to really everybody who said nice words on my latest video about the Great Replacement Theory. The comment section is already a train wreck, but I've seen all the really encouraging positive comments and I try to ignore the negative ones, um, at least the ones that are not constructive criticism. Anyway, uh, so thank you for, for your support with that video. But this stream is all about the Supreme Court. That's why I'm all dressed up for it. And uh, I did one of these, I think, three or four years ago after the Supreme Court term. Um, if you don't know, the Supreme Court, they, they take big chunks of the year off. The Supreme Court of the United States meets um, in the fall. And that's when they hear oral arguments typically. And then sometimes that carries over into the, the winter and spring even. But usually by the end of spring, early summer, that's when they've all announced to the world their decisions. But between when they hear oral arguments and when they announce their decisions, you just don't hear much from them. They're very secretive. And so what happened in the last two or three weeks of June, like the second half of June, basically, they, there was just this flood of huge Supreme Court decisions announced. And it was uh, groundbreaking and really made some people uh, outraged, to say, to say the least. So I'm writing a book about the Supreme Court right now. Um, I haven't really announced that much. I did tweet about it. But this book I've been writing... I've kind of had to rearrange a bunch of things and I, I, I'm just, I may completely redo huge chunks of it because of how this last term has gone, because it has been a very consequential term. And that's a big reason why I'm making this, uh, or I'm doing the, the stream. So thank you for being here. We're going to look at the major Supreme Court decisions of this last term, uh, the most consequential, consequential, I'm having a hard time saying that word. Uh, Let's see. Oh, also, if you are relatively new to my channel, many of you um, know about already my uh, Supreme Court series I've been making since 2017, actually. Yeah, like almost 2016. The very first episode of the series was about Roe v. Wade, <laughs> which is now overturned. So we're going to look at that case first, um, the Dobbs v. Jackson case. But yeah, I have a new episode of Supreme Supreme Court Briefs coming out on Friday. It's not about Dobbs v. Jackson. I'm going to make that later on. In fact, all of these cases, um, I probably won't get to even this year. I want to make sure there's some time has passed to, I would say, adequately, adequately, um, adequately, did I just say a word that doesn't make sense? Um, adequately analyze and mostly reflect. I think it, if you wait too soon, I think a mistake I made in the past was I made the election of 2016 video too soon after the election and, and the 2020 election video too soon. So I'm not, I'm not going to do that after the 2024 election. I, I need to let time pass a little bit more before, because, you know, I make mostly history videos. But yeah, we're looking at very recent history. Thank you. Uh, if you have questions, I'm going to it's great to see some familiar folks in the chat. So I put a link to the website I'm mostly going to be looking at here, this uh, stream, and it's from the New York Times. They did a, um, really what they did is they, they took all the major Supreme Court decisions of, of 2022, and they put it together in, on one interactive page. And this is what we're all going to look at together to get us started here. Wait, let's try this again. Let's get, is that, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I can never, I never know which view to do here. Yeah, we can do that for now. Nah, it's too small though, isn't it? Oh, well, I don't know about that, but thanks for the super chat. <laughs> eh, we'll do the smaller. I'll make me smaller on here. Yeah, so this interactive site is cool because it also shows you where the public stands on 
these issues. So there's this website um, called Supreme Court Public Opinion Project. It's actually a, it's not a website. It's the, the website is actually projects.iq.harbor.edu slash SCOTUS poll. And this is a, um, a, an organization that tracks what Americans are thinking about the U.S. Supreme Court rulings. And they word it in a way that is closely aligned with how the court decides or how they may decide to try to give, you know, try to put the finger on the pulse of the, the public. And I will say just before we look at all these cases that this term, the Supreme Court overwhelmingly decided against the majority of, of public opinion. So that is why they're getting all this negative attention, as you just saw with that super chat. A lot, a lot of people are mad. A lot of people are going to be voting in the midterms in November purely based on the Supreme Court, even though that won't have much of an effect. <laughs> Remember the, I mean, maybe long term, but uh, Congress could pass legislation to counter some of these decisions. But also remember, the president is the one who nominates the Supreme Court justice. justice. The Senate has to approve. Now it doesn't take, a fil I mean, the filibuster is gone with that. So it only takes a simple majority. But yeah, we're going to um, refer to public opinion based on this data. So the first case, obviously, looking at Dobbs v. Jackson's, Jackson Women's Health Organization. This was the case that overthrew, uh, that overturns Roe v. Wade and Casey v. Planned Parenthood. So Roe v. Wade was the, the 19... 70, what was it, two decision that um, effectively legalized abortion up to a certain point. So state laws that banned it or restricted it heavily were overturned. Ever since the 1970s, this has been a wedge issue that has really divided um, Americans. Abortion, it's a, it's a tough issue. Um, people usually associated with the side of, uh, you know, completely against abortions are usually labeled pro-life people that are saying it should be the woman's decision who's pregnant uh, are, are usually labeled pro-choice. But keep in mind that even within those categories, Americans have lots of different opinions on, on the abortion issue. And it's, it's, it's a messy, it's a very complicated issue. Regardless though, you'll see the, um, oh, 1973, that was Roe v. Wade. So, yeah, the court ruled that a Mississippi law that bans most abortions after 15 weeks is constitutional. So it overturned the constitutional right to abortion established by Roe v. Wade. You'll see that the so-called conservative block, I always say so-called because it's not so simple as they make it out to be, but the conservative block all voted to overturn Roe v. Wade, despite many of them going on record saying they would not do so. In fact, a couple of these justices, when before they were sworn in being interrogated, they would they said that was established law, they wouldn't do anything with it. So that's another reason why this has been controversial. But the so-called liberal bloc, of course, voted uh, on the side of Jackson's Women's Health Organization, which uh, was a very controversial place anyway, uh, in Mississippi, um, a place that was the target of many protests I think it was a pink building. It just recently shut down because of this case, but it was a, uh, they called it the little pink building that caused so much controversy. The difference of one, men and women. Um, okay. Not sure. Can I enable slow mode in the chat? Um, you know, I am using a, a, a service called StreamYard. I don't know if I can control that. So <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, so if you look at a public opinion, Democrats, obviously, 73%, that's a, a pretty big majority, um, disagree with this, this decision. 48% of independents, only 31% of Republicans. So most Republicans were happy with this decision. A lot of them only vote on the abortion issue. And I would say my family, most of my extended family, my parents, my brother, my sister, they are so pro-life. That is, they are single issue voters. Um, so people like that, years of doing that is, I mean, they put up with Trump. For, they didn't like Trump, but they voted for him because they knew that he would nominate pro-life justices. So, and he did three pro-life justices that, um, that sure enough, they did what everybody hoped they would. 
So anyway, this is uh, now if you want to know more about the case, I love the site oyes.org. This is where I get most of my information when I do research, when I start for research on my Supreme Court brief series. So it gives you the facts of the case. Um, now, so we need to break out the details here because what it actually said, what uh, the question, the big question was, is Mississippi's law banning nearly all abortions after 15 weeks gestational age unconstitutional? And so they said it was not unconstitutional. So they, they said the state law was fine. Their um, argument was that the Constitution does not mention abortion. Okay, I'm going to read this for you ver verbatim here. Um, let's see here. All right. No. <laughs> All right. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I'll try to get the questions at the end. If you have super chat questions, especially, I'll, I'll uh, take some time at the end. But thank you for those uh, donations. That means a lot. Um, so, yeah, I'll read this again uh, verbatim. So the Constitution does not mention abortion. The right is neither deeply rooted in the nation's history nor an essential essential component of, quote, ordered liberty. The five factors that should be considered in deciding whether a precedent should be overruled support overruling Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Remember, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which I also have a video about, was the, the case that kind of reaffirmed that abortion was a right. Um, it was implied in the Constitution. It was uh, also, they also elaborated saying that you consider the life of the fetus um, if it's able to survive outside the womb, meaning viability, if it can survive outside the womb, then you can restrict abortion. Otherwise, you can't. So anyway, uh, the five factors were, one, they, quote, short-circuited the democratic process. Two, both lacked grounding in the constitutional text, history, or precedent. Three, the tests they established were not, quote, workable. Four, they caused distortion of law in other areas. And five, overruling them would not upend concrete reliance interests. So this is huge. This, this part here, now make it clear that we all need to be clear on this. It did not, this Supreme Court case did not, ban, it did not ban abortion, okay? What it did is it Bring it, brought it back to the states. The states now each can decide whether or not abortion should be legal. And so almost immediately you saw, in fact, you did see immediately in some cases, states now are um, quickly establishing their various forms of restriction. Some states, it's very strict. Like we're talking um, even like less than like, you know, six weeks uh, less than six weeks. It's illegal. Um, no exceptions, even in case of like rape, for example. Um, and then other states, it's, it's less restrictive. Many states, uh, you know, blue states, typically democratic states that, um, at least if you see, judging by how the Senate is, um, have done nothing like they, in fact, some of them are trying to work to pass laws to protect, um, abortion rights. So um, you essentially are going to have a situation now for many years to come where people will be traveling to, if they want to get an abortion, they're going to go from, you know, if they can't get an abortion in their state, their home state, they're going to travel to the nearest state to get an abortion. This is, you're going to probably see clinics right at the border, actually. So anyway, um, I thought that of the, uh, hello. Um, this speech right there. Hello. She doesn't want to be on camera. Um, I thought that Justice Clar Clarence Thomas, um, his, his uh, quote, or I mean, he was the one who, who uh, passed the, the, the ruling down, but there was also a con concurrence by um, Justice, uh, uh, wait, wait, was it Thomas that did the, let me go to the, I want to make sure I get this right. <clears throat> Uh, we see Jackson. Um, so the opinion, you can see uh, verbatim what, what they said on um, SupremeCourt.gov. Um, let's go down here. The opinion of the court is what I'm looking at. Oh, Justice Alito delivered the opinion of the court. What he said to me was less controversial. What kind of alarmed me was what Justice Clarence Thomas said. So I wanted to, uh, to see... Because he concurred, 
along with Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh. But um, I want to find what he said that was a bit alarming. I know we're spending a lot of time on this case, but it's a, it's an important one. Um, let's see here. Where is it at? I might just go to the wiki page. This might be quicker here um, to find what. Um, since you all are waiting on me patiently. So Thomas and Kavanaugh wrote separate concurrences. Okay, so this, I'll just, this, this dumbs it down here as Wikipedia does. Thomas argued that the court should go further in future cases, reconsidering other past Supreme Court cases that granted rights based on substantive, substan substantive, substantive, I can't say that word, due process. Um, so it's the principle that allows courts to establish and protect certain fundamental rights from government interference. Basically, okay, gosh dang, they don't simplify well enough though, do they? Basically, this means that um, in terms of due process, like your rights when in, in, with regards to government intrusion, so with regards to civil liberties, what, like can the government pass a law to restrict your freedoms? Um, they say that it has to be more, I mean, Thomas is essentially saying it has to be explicitly laid out. There's nothing about abortion in the Constitution. Well, you know, so because of this, he's like, well, Griswold v. Connecticut, you know, that was uh, the right to contraception. There's nothing about contraception in the Constitution. Obergefell v. Hodges, that was the one, the right to same-sex marriage. There's nothing about same-sex marriage in the Constitution. Lawrence v. Texas, which I haven't made a video about yet, but the other two I have. Um, there's nothing about uh, sodomy. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing about anything about sex or sexual relations in the, the you know what goes on in the bedroom in the Constitution. Private sexual acts. There, that's what they were. Um, in fact, the word privacy isn't even in the Constitution. So I do. I, I'm going to tell you where I disagree strongly here, and I do disagree with uh, Thomas on this when when he was arguing that because that's quite the slippery slope and you might be thinking well the slippery slope fallacy mr beat don't you think that this this won't actually happen well you know i didn't think roe v wade would be overturned so um you just don't know it maybe it could if you want to get really technical here you could say the, like there's a lot of supreme court cases in which they just straight up implied what the Constitution meant, which means it was their own interpretation. It was the justices' interpretation. And that if that's the case, you can trace it all the way back to 1819 and McCullough v. Maryland, the first Supreme Court case that said the Supreme Court, as part of judicial review, has the right to interpret what the Constitution implies, meaning not what it literally says, but reading between the lines, what does it imply? And if that's the case, you could say, holy crap, you can throw out, uh, you know, inter interracial marriage, um, Loving v. Virginia the case. You could throw out most of the Warren court de de decisions. So that's something to pay close attention to. All right. All right. I kind of went off there to see if I have to catch up with some. There is such a thing as an unenumerated right. The Constitution doesn't explicitly give a right to vote. Yes, voting is another one. But voting is still protected by the Ninth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment, I'm so glad you brought that up, Dave, because the Ninth Amendment is essentially what it says is just because the Constitution doesn't explicitly describe a right doesn't mean you don't have it. In other words... The Bill of Rights is not a complete list. We have other rights that aren't listed because you can't possibly list every single right that we have as human beings. Thank you for that. That was a high quality super chat and thanks for the donation. Okay, I got another, man, look at this. We If we lived in 1850, you'd say slavery was a wedge issue. <laughs> All right, well, it does. Okay. the reason, if you look up the definition of a wedge issue, um, it is really, it comes down to the purpose of the issue. The, the purpose of the issue was um, over the past. This is something that has not just happened overnight. Um, it's evolved to be something that is meant to divide the public. 
It's a political strategy to win voters based on one issue. Um, when you talk about slavery as a wedge issue, it could have been, I think in some cases it was possibly, you can make any issue a wedge is issue. But the point is that it's something that is not entirely, like it's not in front of mind of most Americans all the time. Most Americans care about the economy more than everything. And so this is a, an, an issue that's usually secondary or even tertiary that is brought up as the thing that we always think about in order to win or win elections or make your opponent look bad, just in general. <clears throat> Nick, no state should have the right to vote away basic human rights. Uh, see, that's a great, great argument, too. So you could see another case down the line where that is the argument. <laughs> you really could with new justices in there, of course. Otherwise, they're not, I mean, with the current justices in there right now, you're not going to hear a new case on this. Mr. Beats live streams are what I imagine FDR's fireside chats were like. Would you consider doing this weekly? Or I, I try to do these like, um, oh, thank you very much, Harrison. I try to do these every other week at this point. Um, but, you know, just when I can. Oh, well, thank you, Mar Mauricio. Mauricio, I'm really bad at pronouncing names, but I thank you so much for your support. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk about Morby Harper a little later here, but let's first go through the, uh, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Beast Bod. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's go through these other cases here. So I've said all I want to say about um, Dobbs v. Jackson. Um, so we're going to go more quickly, though, through these other ones because I... Uh, I just want to make sure I'm not going on too long. Thank you. Alex says, hi. Yes. Uh, I do. I mean, based on, well, if it were up to the most senior member of the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, yeah. And I don't think that's alarmist. I think that's just reality. Like, based on his interpretation, you could you could really throw out a lot of, of uh, decisions. And they've already demonstrated this last term. They are not afraid of uh, you know, being very loose with precedent. Precedent, the idea that if a case is decided in the past, then it weighs really heavy and it should be really difficult to over, overturn it. Very few Supreme Court cases in American history have actually been overturned. If you look at, I don't know, I don't know what the percentage is, but I'm thinking that, oh, wow, we might see more and more of these in the next at least couple of years. Hey, we're according to Briggs. Thank you. Citizens United, I have a video about that. Yeah, um, a lot of people agree with you. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Um, but abortion, okay, see, that's the argument. That is exactly the argument at the root of it. So that, because um, pro-life folks argue that, well, what about the right of the fetus or even the embryo? Um, when, when does personhood begin? As a citizen, are you a citizen at birth or are you a citizen actually pre-birth? Yeah, you. thank you for bringing these, these issues up. No, <laughs> it's weird calling you no. Okay, I'm going to go back to this. Uh, thank you for the super chats. But the next case I want to look at is um, West Virginia v. EPA. Environmental Protection Agency. This is another one that really upset a lot of people, and I can understand why. Now, we will see what actually happens, but uh, the, the court's ruling curtailed the EPA's ability to regulate the energy sector, limiting it to measures like emission controls at individual power plants. So the implications of the ruling could, it's a big asterisk there, could um, extend well beyond environmental policy. This is mostly about um, efforts to curb um, carbon to um, prevent the climate from changing as, as quickly as it is. Um, so if you look again, this is uh, appears to be a partisan case. We had the conservative bloc all voting um, for West Virginia, meaning against the EPA, and then the liberal bloc on the EPA side. If you look at the public, where they stand, it's 59%. Oh, yeah, overall, by the way, overall for the um, Dobbs case, it's 51%. So that's a little bit more, uh, you know, divisive. But this one, this one 
59% are on the side of the EPA setting limits on individual power plants um, and can more broadly regulate emissions. So this, this one I think upset people even more in my opinion. Democrats, 73% on the side of EPA with this case, uh, independents, 55% Republicans, even Republicans, a lot of them on the side of the EPA. So um, remember, it was a Republican president who, who uh, signed into law the EPA existing and laws like the Clean Air Act. That was Richard Nixon. So don't just make assumptions here that the Republican Party is like, oh, we don't want to protect the environment. <laughs> um, let's go to the. Oh, by the way. Um, Every single case that the Supreme Court heard uh, this past term, 2021 to 2022, you can you can see by going going to this link. Um, you can see when the they were they granted the case to be heard when it was they heard oral arguments when it was decided, and you even get the citation. So I will link this as well. But we've got the West Virginia v. EPA. Just quickly here, um, and see, you can hear the oral arguments here. You, you can't see video, of course. They only let you hear the audio. But the question was, does the, the Environmental Protection Agency have the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions in virtually any industry so long as it considers cost, non-air impacts, and energy requirements? And I'll just read the most important part here. Um, there's all these fancy names for doctrines, but under the major questions doctrine, there are, and that's under quote. So under the quote, major questions doctrine, there are quote, extraordinary cases in which the quote, history and breadth of the authority that the agency has asserted and the quote, economic and political significance of that assertion provide a quote, reason to hesitate before concluding that Congress meant to confer such authority. This is this, this is one such case of the EPA must point to, quote, clear congressional authorization for the authority it claims. It cannot do so. This a lot of quotes here. I'm going to simplify this for you. Essentially, there are certain cases where the court thinks the, the EPA has too much power and they should just let the, the they're siding with the freedom of uh, essentially those who participate in the marketplace. I'm trying not, I'm trying to make it sound like not like biased one way or another, but critics are saying that, you know, industry wins here too much where they're just, we're going to revert back to a time before the EPA in the 1970s where, you know, it was so unregulated because a lot of this regulation is only effective at the federal level. So if you just leave it to the states again, then it's it's going you're going to see like a river polluted by one company. And then that the effects of that, the you know, like say it's the Mississippi River, like a say Iowa is just like not regulating at all. EPA basically has its hands tied in it because of the Supreme Court. Um, you're gonna see down in uh I don't know, Illinois, you're going to, or on the other side, Illinois is going to have say, well, hey, we use this river too. Um, it's polluted because of what's going on in Iowa. I mean, you essentially, the reason why the EPA is able to function is because it's a federal apparatus, okay? <laughs> like, you, this would not, like, it has to be all or nothing type of deal. So people that are afraid of this decision, they're worried that the EPA is not going to have, it's already, it already has less power today than it's had um, in decades. Like maybe it's weakest now than it's since its creation, you could argue. So when it comes to anything, I mean, this was supposed to be clearly about the, it says right here, the, uh, uh, the 2015 clean power plan. That's what the Trump administration had repealed it. So it, it set guidelines for states to limit carbon dioxide emissions from power plants. Um, and so, of course, they fought this um, and they sided with the Trump administration. Of course, one of the challengers, North American Coal Corporation, um, they didn't like the EPA having the authority to regulate their greenhouse gas emissions because the coal industry, of course, is one of the biggest uh, 
biggest ones guilty of that. So yeah, this is a this is an environmental case that will have huge implications as well. Keep your eye on future EPA cases. Okay, I see some super chats on this in here, so I want to make sure I catch up with them. Um, wow, I got a few here. Thank you. Wow. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Siri Fida. <laughs> uh, I will be calling low representatives not in a live stream. I've decided to do that. I'm going to start doing it next week, actually. Um, and thank you for the kind words, Connor. I already showed that one. Okay. Um, why does a 10 year old girl raped in Ohio have to go to Indiana to get an abortion? That's a good question. I think most people would, uh, most Americans, I'm talking like probably at least 75% of Americans would say, you know what? Um, this girl should have the right to get one. <laughs> she shouldn't have to travel state lines to do so. That was definitely a controversial thing. Uh, John, thank you. Guess what? Clearance, uh, judicial review isn't in the Constitution either. I know, right? If you want to get really technical, you could say, well, throw out Marbury v. Madison. <laughs> uh, that's never going to happen. But um, I, I know some people have brought up Marbury v. Madison like, well, what's the point then of like, can the Supreme Court have any of this power we've been doing over the past 200 and 40 years, uh, 30 years. Anthony, thank you. Mr. Beat, have you seen Top Gun or the new Thor? No, I have not, but a lot of my friends and family have seen both, especially Top Gun. They love it. Separate church from state. I agree strongly with that con man. Con man. <laughs> That's funny. Scott, thank you. Nixon, who created the EPA, would be considered a bleeding heart liberal communist by today's Trumpists. Uh, perhaps so. Perhaps so. Haley from Georgia, uh, slippery slip fallacy isn't really a fallacy for the common law system. Precedent allows anyone to use these extreme arguments in any related issue. Thank you. You articulated it better than I ever could have. So thank you. <laughs> and thanks for the support. Uh, okay, see if I get cut up across. Thank you. Thoughts on Texas GOP rejecting 2020 election and naming gay people as abnormal due to the being, quote, statistically lower in population than cis people. I'm not aware of them actually naming homosexuals as abnormal. That's that's alarming if this is actually true. I need to research it more, but thanks for bringing it to my attention. I, I heard that there's some shenanigans going on in Texas. I don't know enough about it. Um, I do know that with abortion laws, they're, they're pretty strict as well. Oh, so you want to play, huh? Nowhere in the Constitution does it grant the federal government the authority to, quote, protect the environment. Yeah. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say a lot of things. Uh, the federal government's powers have gone far beyond. Okay, but this is an appeal to authority fallacy. Just because the founders intend, intended something um, doesn't mean, like, if, if your argument stands true, then you might as well throw it all out. You might as well throw every Supreme Court decision because like I said this earlier, I don't know if you caught it, but going back to 1819, the Supreme Court has literally looked at the Constitution, saw stuff that was not written in the Constitution, not explicitly there and said, hey, it's not there, but it implies this. OK. So if you are ready to get, I'm, I'm assuming you want, you like privacy. There's nothing about privacy in the constitution. There's nothing about the right to have clean drinking water in the constitution. Um, there's a lot of things that are not in the constitution. It's a short document. You should read it sometime. There's not much there. So if you're going to say this, you got to own it. Okay. You can't just like cherry pick what you don't like the government doing. It's got to be all or nothing, or you've got to throw out the whole system and start from scratch. Maybe that's what we need to be doing, actually. Maybe there needs to be another constitutional convention. I don't know. It is in trouble, Donald. <laughs> it is. Or Burger v. Hodges is in... I don't want to be alarmist or um, sensationalized. I, 
like, I don't think most of these cases are going to be overturned. I really don't think that because let's face it, the Supreme Court's not supposed to be as political, but they oftentimes are. Um, and at least in the back of their mind, they're thinking about the implications politically, the, what's going to happen in the next election already. We're going to see that in the midterms, Republicans should be dominating the midterms. Inflation alone is the issue that most Americans care about the most. That's why they want to vote Republican. But if you look at polls now, Democrats are gaining ground, and it is probably because of how the Supreme Court decided on abortion. This could be an issue that actually plays a role in the midterms. Uh, no, the child, the child who was her, uh, her child was, was not a black child. You're just kind of making up stuff there, but, but thank you for the support. Uh, Exactly. Luminous has it guarantees the right to buy arms with some weapons. Yes. Thank you. Luminous, you are. Okay. So let's go back to um, cases here. Next up, we have Biden v. Texas. This was a surprise. So I wanted to also show you the cases. Now, it wasn't as much a surprise to me, but to a lot of people, you had conser the supposed conservative block voting with the liberal block. Kavanaugh and Roberts joined up with the liberal block and sided with Biden, okay? Imagine Trump like uh, at home hearing about this decision, knowing that Kavanaugh, who he, he was a big, obviously he nominated him, said nothing but good praise for him. And then he finds out that, oh, you're siding with Biden because what this case said with immigration, which was one of Trump's big issues, um, it said the court, the court said the Biden administration could end a Trump era immigration program that forces asylum seekers arriving at the southwestern border to await approval in Mexico. So if you look at this, this case actually is very, like if you look at where the public stands, it's 49 percent agree that the Biden administration should be able to end the remain in Mexico program. This is controversial. Um you know, even with independence, only 44% of them sided with the Biden administration here. So, and yet we see conservatives joining up here um, with the liberal bloc. So I want to just briefly look at the question here um, for this case. So Biden v. Texas, um, just in case you're not familiar with the details, back in 2018, Trump had announced the migrant protection protocols under which policy certain non-citizens non arriving at the southwestern border of the United States were returned to Mexico during their immigration proceedings. So it's essentially like, you know, you have an illegal immigrant here, instead of just keeping them and like us taking care of them, then we, we send them back to Mexico until it all gets sorted out. Um, when Biden took over um, in June 2021, they ended the policy in response not only Texas, but Missouri, for some reason, I'm not sure why, um, fought back against it. And the big question was, must the Biden administration continue to enforce the Trump administration's migrant protection protocols, or does the Biden Department of Homeland Security decision ending the policy have legal effect? So they sided with Biden, but the rationale is, although the district court lacked jurisdiction to issue its injunction, the Supreme Court has jurisdiction to review the case. By using the word may confers a discretionary authority to return non-residents to Mexico. Historical context confirms this understanding. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I think the, uh, yeah, I think the main thing here is they're, they're saying that this is a valid way the executive branch can act here and because it's not, it's not going against the Immigration and Nationality Act. Um, and that's the bottom line. It's not going against a law that has been established for many years. So that's it. It doesn't matter the, the like the personal beliefs. Like, I don't know. I would assume, actually, someone like Justice Brett Kavanaugh would say, hey, I personally think that Trump's policy, the migrant protection protocols, um, was actually good. I think it's a good thing for the country. However, Kavanaugh maybe at least has the um, 
ability to to ignore his own bias and say, hey, according to the Constitution, the Biden administration can reverse it. So I applaud him for that. Um, we need more justices to do stuff like that. <laughs> all right, got some more super chats here. Thank you. This is great. Great to see you all here. Uh, like I know for me, it's a Sunday afternoon. Whoa, look at that. Thank you for that support. Any recommendations on books about history like the Gilded Age and the Enlightenment? Enlightenment. Thank you for the kind words. Um, specifically, the Gilded Age. I have there's this book called Railroaded that I, I highly recommend uh, by Richard White. I have, actually have it back there on my bookshelf. Um, the Enlightenment. I don't know, but I do have an entire book list if you want to check it out on my website. I am MrBeat.com. <laughs> oh boy. I, I drank a lot of coffee today. You can tell, can't you? Okay. Her, Herb Gamer. I don't like how the Supreme Court has become more of a political institution. Yeah. I would have to agree with it. That's not new. It's been political since this little guy named John Marshall. He was like, he, and remember, John Marshall was one of the few people in American history who was members of all three branches of government. Before he was chief justice of the Supreme Court, he was in the executive branch in the cabinet, and also as a legislator at the state level. So, uh, but yeah, justices become hypocrites. So the only, I'm just going to push back a little bit here and say, hey, um, at least justices don't have to worry about elections. And so a lot of times they are going to not be as afraid to just go with what they think the Constitution says versus like what the public wants to hear. And that's that's a good thing. Now, that said, there's no term limits, so they could be 50 years in um, and be completely out of touch with society and have just radical opinions. That's the problem, I think, that's um, that needs to be addressed. There needs to be some kind of term limit for Supreme Court justices, in my opinion. Now, that said, it shouldn't be short. It should be at least probably 20 years, in my opinion, maybe 25. Um, but, yeah, a lot of people, I think, agree with you. Okay, so now... The next case that's a big one we should bring up. So that dealt with immigration. We looked at climate change. The next one was about Native Americans. It was really interesting to see um, what Gorsuch, Neil Gorsuch, who personally, I'm a fan of Gorsuch. I know people are confused by that because they assume that like I only like left-leaning justices. No, I think Neil Gorsuch is like one of the most intelligent justices we've ever had. I Even if I disagree with him, like if you look at his, uh, what he writes, like, it's convincing. Like he, it's well thought out. He's not just somebody who's, I mean, he's, I compare him to Scalia a lot. They have a lot of similarities, but anyway, he did vote with the liberal bloc with this, but essentially this is a, the case is called Oklahoma v. Castro Huerta. After ruling that much of Oklahoma falls within Indian reservations, the court ruled that the state authorities may prosecute non-Indians who commit crimes against Indians on those reservations. So, this conservative block won out here. However, the dissent, let's look at this case a little bit here. Um, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Castro, let's go through the, the facts of the case really quickly here. Facts of the case. Victor Manuel Castro Huerta, a non-native, was convicted in Oklahoma State Court of Child Neglect, and he was sentenced to 35 years. The victim, his stepdaughter, is Native American, and the crime was committed within the Cherokee Reservation. It's a huge area within Oklahoma. Castro Huerta challenged his conviction, arguing that under the Supreme Court's 2020 decision in McCurt v. Oklahoma, another very important case, which, yeah, which held that states cannot prosecute crimes committed on Native American lands without federal approval, Oklahoma argued that McCurt involved a native defendant, whereas Castro Huerta is non-native, so McCurt does not bar his prosecution. So they sided on the on Oklahoma's side because um, the jurisdiction to prosecute crimes committed by non-natives against non-natives on Native American lands is granted to states. Um, if there's one person who's non-native then they, the state can step in, is essentially what the court said here. Um, now, again, Justice Neil Gorsuch authored a dissenting opinion, joining, joined by the liberal block of the, the court, arguing that the court's decision um, reneges on the federal government's centuries-old promise that tribes would remain forever free from interference by state authorities. 
Boom, Gorsuch, you got it right here. Okay, stuff like that. That's why I like Gorsuch, okay? I know sometimes he, he makes really poor decisions. I get it, but <laughs> I, I get a lot of flack. Like, how can you like him? Okay, so let's uh, go back to the comments here and see if I can catch up with these. Sorry if I miss any of these. Um, I think constitutional monarchies um, are tolerable. Um, obviously, absolute monarchy, monarchies are horrible. <laughs> Roe v. Wade has pointed hypocrisy on both sides. What? Why are issues so absolute? There are things that uh, I agree that was slightly on both sides that we can make it so partisan instead of working together. Very good point, Pershing. And I actually, I think that um, I agree with you. <laughs> that was kind of the wedge issue thing you're hinting at there that I brought up earlier. You're still alive. Great to hear. Thank you uh, for the support. Realistically, what do you think would happen if any state just outright ignores whatever law SCOTUS rules on? Well, uh, we saw that with Wooster v. Georgia. Um, in fact, it wasn't just the state ignoring. It was the president himself, Andrew Jackson. Um, but yeah, they don't have an army like the executive branch does. So has the state done that before? Yeah, they have Georgia, but they were counting on Andrew Jackson protecting that. But that's how they were able to kick the Cherokee off their land in Georgia. Um, I think it, it could happen if the support is there from the president. From the, if the executive branch supports them, then you never know. Like, look at Biden already with his executive orders trying to counter the Dobbs decision. All right. How long do you think that native tribes will have sovereignty in the U.S. going on multiple decades or centuries? Um, this is something that it's a good point to bring up. Um, Alyssa, um, I recognize you. You're, yeah, thank you for the support. Um, yeah, I think the over time, what we will see probably is less and less sovereignty because let's face it, um, you're going to see compromises made from generations that are more down the line. They're less connected with their ancestors. So I think that's a really good uh, question. Actually, it's something I haven't really thought much about that I, I need to think more about. Okay. So we're back to major cases decided. And the next one, this is the one that caught a lot of people's attention. I actually tweeted about this one, just kind of being a little ornery, um, trolling a little bit, as I do on Twitter, as most people do. Um, school prayer. Now, there's a case called Lemon v. Kurtzman uh, that I have a video about that famously addressed this, that um, the separation of church and state specifically when it comes to school. There's also... Angle v. Vital. Um, you essentially, and then there's West Side Middle School um, uh, v. Oh gosh, what's the name of that one? Uh, I have a video about that one too. West Side v. Mergens. West Side Middle School. West Side Middle School is where I taught. This was at West Side High School in Omaha, Nebraska. Anyway. So the court has mostly gone on the side. If you look the past 40, 50 years, the court has mostly gone on the side of keep religion out of schools. So this case um, represents a big shift. OK, um, a big one. <laughs> In my opinion, this case maybe will have after the Jackson v. Dobbs case, the, the biggest um, impact long term. Yeah. This is the Kennedy case. I didn't write that one down, did I? Oh, yeah, I did. Okay. So um, let's go ahead. And I'm going to bring up the OEA page if I can find it. There it is. Kennedy v. Bremerton School District. Okay. So the facts of the case, Joseph Kennedy, a high school football coach, engaged in prayer with a number of students during and after school games. His employer, the Bremerton School District, asked that he could discontinue the practice in order to protect the school from a lawsuit based on violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Kennedy refused and instead rallied local and national television, print media, and social media to support him. I remember seeing this on Facebook, actually. Kennedy sued the school district for violating his rights under the First Amendment and Title IX of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The district court held that because the school district suspended him solely on, because of the lack or because of the risk of constitutional liability associated with his religious conduct, its actions were justified. Kennedy appealed. 
So yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so the big question was, is a public school employee's prayer during school sports activities protected speech? And if so, can the public school employer prohibit it to, to avoid violating the establishment clause? The court said, yes, it is. They sided with the coach, Kennedy. And so if you look at um, public opinion, actually, um, that would be, most people would actually agree with this. However, I strongly disagree with this one. <laughs> I do. I think that this, I mean, the, the establishment clause, um, and again, this is, this is implication, but also like you look at years and years and years of other cases precedent. Um, you have to side with, okay, you don't want students to feel like they are less of a citizen because of their religion. If you're forcing students who are not, and you, they don't, they don't force them, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that there was a lot of peer pressure. Like if you're not Christian, like I say, you're a Jewish or Muslim or whatever, or non-religious, and you're you're kind of pressured to pray in the middle of the field as part of the football team. Um, that's not right to me. Like, I don't think you should be pressured to like, you know, I guess practice in a religion. Um, public schools are meant to be places where anybody is welcome, no matter what your religion is. We have private schools, Christian schools, many of them, that's, that's what those are for, you know, like you can do that. Um, so yeah, I disagree with this one, but apparently I'm in the minority according to this polling because um, 44%, uh, according to this anyway, say the public or the public says the school district was right to suspend the coach. Um, now maybe there's other, like maybe they said, oh, he shouldn't have been suspended, but we still disagree with um, prayers being led before and after games. So I think the way that that question was worded might change it. Um, I think that there's an argument saying that, yeah, suspending him was maybe overboard. However, I'm a strong proponent of separation of church and state. So um, this was this one is another one that could lead. I mean, it, it essentially, if I remember correctly, this is the one that over, overthrew Lemon v. Kurtzman. Um, yeah, I, I looked at this... Uh, yeah, the decision overturns Lemon v. Kurtzman, uh, the 1971 case, um, and the subsequent Lemon test, which had been used to evaluate government actions within the scope of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, but had been falling out of favor in the decade prior. So, yeah, uh, this is a this is one that I think we need to. I mean, this this could have wide ranging implications, where you could see more and more cases where they side with. Uh, religion now when we say siding with religion we almost always kind of we we mean in the united states we're siding with christianity that is the dominant religion in fact um, most of the founders of this country were christian in some way or another um, that influenced the way they wrote the constitution undoubtedly but they also many of the founders also said there needs to be a separation there because they had seen what had happened in other countries when you combined uh, when you had theocracies, you know, and we see it today too, like the damage that's done in places like Iran and Saudi Arabia, where there's no separation of church and state, where in Saudi Arabia, if I remember, or if I remember correctly, the constitution is the Quran. Like to me, that is horrifying, horrifying. So um, again, we need to be careful with slippery slope fallacy here. It doesn't mean that we're going to see like, um, you know, the constitution just be interpreted as only a Christian document. And, <laughs> but we need to keep an eye on this one. We need to keep an eye on this one. All right. What we got here? Yeah, exactly. Like if it's, I tweeted out, if, uh, you had Satan, Satanists go out to the field and pray before and after the game, um, like if the coach was a uh, satanic, then the reaction would be different. Let's just be honest here. Let's not, um, try to like, you can't just think of it through the lens of your own religion. 
uh, by my logic, if someone is bullied for praying, that then that means everyone should be forced to pray. Public means free expression. Oh no, 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 no. Yeah, like I, I don't know if you know about the dynamics in a in a classroom or on a football team. Maybe you were never a member of a football team, or maybe you didn't go to public schools. But like, you shouldn't like if you if everybody is participating around you you feel pressured to do the same because you will be bullied if you don't participate in many cases. Not, I'm not like, oh, I'll steal your lunch money or like getting beat up in the hallway. I mean, like there's other forms of bullying, whether it be online or just mo the, the most common form of bullying in my opinion today is isolation. Um, you are excluded from social circles. Um, so I, you know, I favor openness to all different types of people. Um, if you're going to do something that alienates even one person at a public school, that's supposed to be there for everyone because the taxpayers pay for it. Everybody pays for it. Everybody should be welcome. Like the park, you want to go to the park and say, like, do take over a public park. Um, like a bunch of satanic people took over a park, and like if you wanted to go to that park to to you know play basketball. But every time you went there, you're surrounded by Satanists everywhere. And they're all like saying you can't use that court unless you, you know, I don't know, bow down to Satan or something. Uh, that's wrong. <laughs> so I hope you're understanding my logic here. Maybe you're not. Maybe I'm not clear enough. Who was the better president, FDR or Ronald Reagan, or why? Um, I think they're both uh, pretty solid, but FDR was better, I think, just because he got more done. Um, that's my short answer. Okay. Oh, I was born in Germany and I'm an American now, partly because you guys advertised it well to me. Holy crap. Well, that's awesome. Welcome to the United States. Um, my favorite country. Thanks for being here. <laughs> that's awesome. Holy crap. Okay. I'm going to go back to uh, the cases here. Again, this website I've linked in the description of this video. You can see um, it's the major 2022 Supreme Court decisions. We already went over Dobbs. Um, okay, so this one just briefly is about the Second Amendment. Um, the New York State Rifle is New York State Rifle and a Pistol Association v. Bruin, or it might be Brun. I think it's Bruin. The court ruled that states with strict limits on carrying guns in public violate the Second Amendment. This is one um, that forty-seven percent. Uh, agree with how the court decided. This is another apparently partisan decision where the six conservative bloc justices voted on the side of, um, you know, making it easier to carry guns in public, and the, the three liberal bloc were against that. Um, so I think the, the bottom line is, I mean, personally, I agree with the court in this case, um, but you do have some states like, I mean, New York is where this took place. And yeah, it was uh, the thing about carrying guns in public. I can understand that like so many people are uncomfortable by that. And so um, that's the reason why we have these laws. Like accidents also can happen. Um, but at the same time, you have police officers that can do that in every state. So I think it's one of those situations where there's gray area. Uh, I don't think the implications of this one are going to be that heavy. Um, maybe if you disagree with me in the comments, you can say so, though. I, um, this one is another separation of church and state case, Carson v. Macon. In this case, the court ruled that a main program that excludes religious schools from a state tuition program is a violation of the free exercise of religion. So this is very similar, again, to the, um, oh, the football coach case. Okay. Kennedy v. Bremerton. Um, because you essentially have like, but I mean, it's, it's similar. You have, this is a, well, let's get into the details of this one, actually, because I want to make sure I get it right. So Carson v. Macon, you have um, the state of Maine relies on local, I'll just read it. The state of Maine relies on local school administrative units to ensure that every school-aged child in the state has access to a free education. Not every SAU operates its own public secondary school. To meet the state requirements, an SAU without its public secondary school may either, number one, 
contract with a secondary school to provide school privileges, or number two, pay the tuition of a secondary school at which a particular student is accepted. In either circumstance, the secondary school must be either a public school or an, quote, approved private school. To be an, quote, approved school, a private school must meet the state's compulsory attendance requirements uh, and must be non-sectarian in accordance with the First Amendment. All right. Sounds fairly reasonable. So we had some families led by the Carsons uh, that they lived in SAUs or again, school administrative units that did not operate a public secondary school of their own, but instead provide tuition assistance to parents to send, to send their, their kids to an approved private school. The three families opted to send their children to private schools that are accredited, but do not meet the non-sectarian requirement because they are religiously affiliated. So they were not approved. That's why they sued. The question was, does a state law prohibiting students participating in an otherwise generally available student aid program from choosing to use their aid to attend schools that provide religious or sectarian instruction go against the religious clauses or equal protection clause of the U.S. Constitution? Equal protection clause is the clause brought up the, the most, and that's from the 14th Amendment. And in so many Supreme Court cases, you, that's the that's the clause. That's the one. And again, so much is implied with that 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 simple, very short clause of the 14th Amendment. Conclusion, uh, they sided with the families, the courts did. So um, essentially. Uh, said this requirement um, do not operate. OK, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it says the court held that the free exercise clause did not permit, uh, oh, Missouri also was involved. So a state to discriminate against otherwise eligible recipients by disqualifying them from a public benefit solely because of the religious character. So going back to um, the public like uh, opinion of this, where the public stands is, uh, again, this is contentious. This is, so they say, uh, as far as the side prohibiting state funds from being used at religious schools is a valid separation between church and state. 51% agree with that. Okay, so 51% was on the side of Macon or the, the state of, the, of Maine and Missouri. <laughs> Um, and then 49% um, said that was a violation. So I can actually, this one, I'm not so, conv I mean, I don't know about this one. I'm more in the middle. I can see both sides pretty strongly. So, um, but again, related to the other case, uh, Kennedy v. Bremerton, you do have to wonder what direction the court's going with this because more and more, like even just taking on these cases to begin with, where you're like, you favor these cases that deal with the establishment clause, that should be a sign that they're willing to vote or make decisions more boldly on this issue. And again, the separation of churches and state is very important to me. Now, a lot of these other cases here, they're important, but it's, look at this, 9-0. Okay, we forget that these 9-0 cases still happen. So Shirt left v. Boston, the court ruled that the city of Boston had violated the First Amendment when it refused to let a private group raise a Christian flag in front of its city hall, although it had allowed many other organizations to use the flagpole to celebrate various causes. Yeah, that last part there, that to me shows, okay, we've got discrimination going on. Now, I think the, the justices approach this with different reasons, and they, you know, they're all coming at this from different frames of mind, but they come to the same conclusion. All right. All of them agree um, that, you know, Boston cannot discriminate when it's like you're not letting this uh, one group fly a Christian flag, but you're letting these other organizations use uh, fly flags to celebrate all kinds of stuff. So uh, in terms of where the public stands, 56 percent seems to agree with the court, which is not as high as I thought, actually. <laughs> and another 9-0 case, First Amendment and censures. So a censure is, if you don't know what that is, essentially it's where um, you can be silenced, like a member of government um, can be silenced and not allowed to participate in certain things. So this case is called Houston Community College System v. Wilson. I'm actually going to pull that one up. 
the, the question was, does the First Amendment restrict the authority of an elected body to issue a censure resolution in response to a member's speech? So like if somebody get, like gives a speech, a member of government gives a speech that's really just crazy, really offensive, um, really harmful, damaging to the, the legislative body, can the, the legislative body actually vote to like say, hey, you can't do that anymore. You can't just be saying these speeches that like say all this crazy stuff. The court said, yes, you can't, the, the legislative body can restrict the speech of members of, now their rationale was, uh, oops, their rationale was when they're talking about the first amendment, because the, the argument was like, oh, you're preventing a member from speaking, but it's where they speak. So a purely verbal censure does not give rise to an actionable first amendment claim. Justice Neil Gorsuch authored the opinion saying, uh, Wilson lacked an actionable First Amendment claim against the Houston Community College system. Um, that must have been where he. Oh, OK, so he was OK. It was part of the. Oh, I should have read the whole background here, but uh, the, the larger point stands, though. Um, so elected bodies have long exercised the power to censure their members and the court's precedents affirm that mere censure does not afoul of the First Amendment. Uh, that Wilson was an elected official and that the censure itself was mere speech by other members within. So the fact that, the, okay, that's the point I'm trying to make here is that the speech was only among other elected uh, members. So it's not like he can still speak other places. He can go on Twitter. He can go out on a corner of the street and, protest or whatever and uh but just like within that context he can't so yeah remember the first amendment is not absolute the free speech is not absolute there are exceptions a long list of exceptions actually okay we are uh, almost done here then i'll take some more questions if you want but that was another 9-0 case this one was also fairly overwhelming uh eight to one the only uh, dissenter was uh justice thomas Ramirez v. Collier, the court ruled that Texas would violate a federal law protecting religious freedom if it executed a death row inmates without allowing his pastor to, to touch him and pray aloud in the execution chamber. Uh, looks like majority of the public is on. Um, it's interesting here to see that it's 56 percent Democrats, 59 percent Republicans, 59 percent independents. Yeah, that's uh, that they agree that barring religious cl clergy from touching death row inmates in the execution chamber violates the first amendment. Yeah. To me, I think this is obviously like, like, why can't you allow somebody from your faith to be there in that, that moment, you know, uh, where you're getting ready to die. Like it, it seems like cruel, honestly, <laughs> uh, well, the death penalty, there's a strong argument that it's cruel as well. <laughs> but yeah, just not letting them have that kind of, uh, you know, allowing them to have that comfort before they are executed. So yeah, um, I'm curious what Thomas said as far as his dissent, though. I'm going to pull that up real quick here, what his dissent would have said. I wonder if they said that there. Okay, Justice Clarence Thomas argued that Ramirez was simply seeking to further delay his execution. Oh, okay, and that his claims either do not warrant equitable relief or a, are procedurally barred. You know what, Thomas? I actually see your point there. All right, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, admittedly, I don't know as much of these other cases here. So we've also got United States v. Zubida. Z Zubida? The court ruled that the government was not required to disclose the location of a CIA black site where a detainee at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, had been tortured. Yeah, I knew about this case. In fact, I got a little angry about this case when I heard it. I um, disagree. And it's interesting because this is another one that it's the only two that dissented were Neil Gorsuch. Good job, Neil. And Sotomayor. Good job. Sotomayor, actually, uh, I usually disagree with her on a lot. <laughs> so I think I agree with them. Um, I think that there should be more transparency when it comes to, especially when you have places where um, there's accusations of torture. I mean, that's, it's disturbing. Guantanamo Bay, in my opinion, um, it's the fact that that even exists um, is problematic. <laughs> 
Um, it's unbelievable that it actually still exists. I mean, it's like a loophole they found so that they could um, deny basic rights to people who are, you know, under due process. So, um, but if you look at the details of it, this is a fascinating case, actually. I, I bet most of you haven't even heard of this one. So you have Zain Hussain, Hussain uh, or Zubu, Zubayda is a former associate of Osama bin Laden. Oh, boo. Okay, but yeah. Uh, U.S. military forces captured him in Pakistan and detained him abroad before moving him to Guantanamo Bay. He's still there. Zubayda alleged that before, before being transferred to Guantanamo, uh, he was held at a CIA dark site, quote, dark site, which means it's off the map. It's, it's not really, it's not ex, ex, uh, disclosed to anybody, to, not, not disclosed to the public. Um, in Poland, where two former CIA contra oh, contractors oof, used, quote, enhanced interrogation technique. Okay, they tortured him, uh, is the allegation here. And yada, yada. The question is, did the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit there? Oh, no, no. So the, the quite actually, let me reword this here because this is getting con confusing. Um, we're talking about state secret privilege. OK. In certain cases, most people agree the government's allowed to keep secrets from the public in the name of security. All right. And so that's where the gray area is. Um, I lean on the side of privacy and transparency versus security. That's just my personal bias. Um, but they said that, no, like it was the state secrets privilege applied here. Um, you know, there was a there was a danger of harm to national security. Now, the, the dissent, um, Neil Gorsuch, what did he say? And so the Mayor joined. Okay, Gorsuch pointed out that the events took place two decades ago and have since been declassified. That was the part that I I forgot about. That's why I was I just yeah, it's been just declassified in the subject of numerous books, movies, and official reports. As such, while dismissing the suit might save the government quote embarrassment, doing so will not quote safeguard any secret. All right, I agree with Gorsuch in this case, and so do Mayor. Again, an example of a case where people of supposedly different ideological partisan backgrounds join forces. We have uh, two or three more here real quick. Um, there is Trump v. Thompson. So this is a case de dealing with uh, White House records. The court ruled that former President Donald Trump could not block the release of White House records to a House committee investigation of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. A lot of people knew about this one. Most people agree with the court. It was eight to one. Guess who the lone dissenter was? Clarence freaking Thomas, whose wife was in, implicated by many as being involved with um, having close ties, or at least having close ties with the January 6th attack on the Capitol. So we'll just leave that there. Uh, COVID in the workplace. Oh, yeah, this is another one that made a lot of headlines uh, a few months ago, I believe. Yeah, January 13th is when it was decided. National Federation of Independent Business versus Department of Labor. The court found that the Biden administration's vaccine or testing mandate for large employers was not lawful. So this was uh, actually predicted, uh, again, along party lines here. Um, I actually agree with the conservative bloc in this case. And it looks like, though, it uh, fits 50-50 in terms of most Americans. <laughs> wow. So, um, and then... The last one, Biden v. Missouri. The court found that the Biden administration's mandate to require health care workers at facilities receiving federal money to be vaccinated was lawful. So this was interesting because it, it's related to the this one up here. And I think the difference with Biden v. Missouri was that we're talking about um, public health in terms of this one is just talking about um, testing like and an additional loophole, basically, to uh, to make a in the name of public health, where this one is like, you know what, vaccinations um, for public health is okay if and like that. That's for pr the private sector. This is for like if 
there's federal government money involved, or especially like if it's literally the federal government that's requiring this, the Biden administration was okay with that. So it's interesting because Kavanaugh actually joined up, uh, Kavanaugh and Roberts, who's usually seen as more moderate, they both joined up with the liberal bloc on this one. All right, so there it all is. Um, those are the, the big cases. Um, now, there's also been a lot of questions I've got about uh, a future case, and we will get to that in a moment. Um, but first, let me check on the questions I've missed. Uh, still got my robe here. Yeah. Yeah, man, I'm getting uh, sweaty. It's hot in this robe. Okay. If you replace Christianity with Islam, oh, that's different. I already saw that one. Or that's the same one. Okay. Uh, sorry. Let me scroll down here. Do you think that KBJ uh, will side with the conservatives? On, oh, you're talking about the new justice, uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson. Uh, will side with this conservative because she took the place of uh, Justice Breyer just, uh, just a few days ago. Do you think KBJ will side with the conservatives on Second Amendment cases, given her background as a defense attorney? Public defender supported Second Amendment as an individual right pre Heller and filed a brief for NYSRPA in Bruin. That's a great question. I think she's going to have a fairly nuanced uh, perspective. However, I don't think it's going to be as... Uh, I mean, I do think she's going to lean more on, on the Second Amendment side. I, I mean, I, I believe that she was OK with the Heller decision. But remember, the Heller decision, um, both gun control advocates and Second Amendment rights purists saw that case as a victory for different reasons. Like uh, the, the, the gun rights activists saw it as a victory. The Heller case is like, oh, yeah. This is proof that the Second Amendment is there for our self-defense. But on the other side, it showed, like, if you are wanting the government to have stronger regulations on guns, that, yeah, the government can step in sometimes to make it harder to get weapons. And especially when we're not talking about just guns, that was, was the case with that, like, but more serious weapons um, and even more serious types of guns. FDR is my favorite president and an inspiration of mine. Love that man besides the Japanese camps and some overreaching of power. Yeah, the Japanese um, internment camps and overreaching of power is the reasons why he's not in my top five. He's still pretty much in my top 11 or 12 for best presidents of all time. Okay. I'm trying to catch these all. Sorry if I missed any. I'm, I, uh, I'm often in a one-man operation here. Uh, by your logic, Washington using a Bible to be sworn in breaks separation. Uh, secularism just means not using religion to legislate law, not banning religious expression in government institutions. Okay, you do have a good point, but Washington using a Bible is not the same as a coach or teacher um, leading prayer because there's a difference between having a personal, doing something personally, and then forcing others to join you. When you force others to join you, then that, then that expands your influence and that could lead to um, certain people feeling like they're pressured. But I do, I do hear your point. You're making some really good points. Give me some stuff to think about. Reps uh, Bobert Green contends separation of church and state isn't in the Constitution. <laughs> yeah, it's not. A lot of stuff isn't in the Constitution, but only in a, quote, dumb letter by Jefferson. What's your opinion on this stance and on both sides of these ladies? Uh, I think that um, it's not just Jefferson. Many of the founders actually wrote, it wasn't just one letter. Um, there are many letters, many documents, many, actually mostly articles. Um, I believe even one of the Federalist Papers might have mentioned it. Um, I'm, I'm not, I might be misremembering that, but lots of articles, lots of letters. Um, and even that all said, we are getting again, we are going to, oh, the founder said this, the founder said that. Look, that was 250 years ago. Um, we are living in the year 2022, not 1787. So 
let's try to avoid the appeal to authority fallacy where we're just like, well, they said it, so it, sh it should hold up. No, I mean, if Thomas Jefferson was around today and he had access to all the new information, what would be his his conclusion? I, I, I don't think his conclusion would be the same as Bobert and Green. That's for sure. So, um, so you can't just say like, because their wisdom, the founder's wisdom was based on what was happening at the time. A lot has happened since then. A lot of a lot has happened that they ha they haven't thought about. They hadn't thought about because there's no way they could have thought about everything. And so we can't just assume that you know there a lot of a lot of especially with technology. Um, people bring this up a lot with the Second Amendment. It's like the founders never would have envisioned that you know the atomic bomb, that nuclear weapons would exist. Of course. So you've got to, based on new information, adjust your opinion. You can't just have the same opinion. Um, like in a vacuum, that's uh, ridiculous. Okay. If I missed any super chats, I apologize. I think I got them all though. Okay. So, more V. Harper. Let's pull that one up. So, uh, Moore v. Harper, uh, let me just go ahead and pull up the SCOTUS blog here. This is a case that the court will be hearing in October, and this is causing a lot of political pundits to freak out. Many of them are really sensationalizing this and, you know, alarmist completely. I think it's a little exaggerated, but this is still deeply concerning. So the issue is, let's see if you zoom in here a little bit on that. Whether, or, whether a state's judicial branch may nullify, so, so say a uh, regulations are no good, nullify the regulations governing the quote, manner of holding elections for senators and representatives prescribed by the legislator thereof and replace them with regulations of the state's court's own devising based on vague state constitutional provisions. This is why people don't like dealing with lawyers. Why can't you just put this in a language that we all can understand? That's part of the reason why I started the Supreme Court brief series, because why are people going to be interested when they can't? This seems like a foreign language. Okay, you know what? Here's what's going on with the um, Morby Harper. Essentially, right now, in states, if a um, state legislature abuses its power or is accused of abusing their power with mostly um, redistricting, so we usually, like when we talk about gerrymandering, for example, they draw up districts in a way to favor their political party or to hurt their opponent's political party for future elections, a lot of times when they do this, immediately afterwards, the opposing political party will sue them and they will say, you need to redraw these district maps because they are unfair. They favor one political party over another, which goes against the 14th Amendment, due process or the Equal Protection Clause. Also, you do have other shenanigans that like certain laws that can suppress voting rights that that target specific groups of people. Like uh, this is was notoriously this happened down in uh, the, during the Jim Crow era throughout the South. You had laws that said, oh, no, everybody can vote. That's a constitutional right. Everybody, you know, that's you can't deny the right to vote. However, if you want to vote, you've got to jump through this hoop and this hoop. You got to pay this fee. You've got to pass this literacy test. You need to uh, make sure you register uh, six months in advance. And if you move. Uh, you know, you have to tell us at least within two days of moving, or if you don't, then there's another delay of uh, another three months. I don't know. It, it, basically, it's still legal, but there are additional hurdles. Um, but yeah, we're mainly talking about gerrymandering and redistricting in a way that only favors one political party where the, the legislators essentially pick the voters instead of the voters picking the legislators. It's really messed up. Gerrymander, if you don't know anything about it, I have a couple of videos on it. I did a live stream on it a couple of weeks ago. 
All right, I'm talking too long. Let me simplify this again. Moore v. Harper is essentially the question is, um, I, I know I was, I was trying to oversimplify and then I ended up going way complicated. Essentially, the courts right now can override the legislators in states if the courts feel like the legislators are violating the Equal Protection Clause and like saying that you're being unfair to certain voters or you're gerrymandering or you're, you're, you're doing something messed up to make it harder to vote. This case, if the court sides uh, with, uh, let's see who's more in this case. If the court, I, I don't know so what, who's on what side here, Moore and Harper. No, wait, let me go back to the, where is it at? Let's just go to the wiki on here. Um, so we're talking about North Carolina and independent state legislature doctrine, which essentially says, hey, the Constitution doesn't say anything about elections. It should be entirely, entirely state legislators that are doing everything with elections. And that includes federal elections, not just local elections, but federal. Um, historically, the courts have ruled against the independent state legislature doctrine, saying, no, nah, if, if state legislators are up, up to shenanigans, then the courts can step in and say, you can't do that. That's unconstitutional. No, nah. it goes against, especially with regards to the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. If this case goes in the favor of North Carolina's legislators, then independent state legislature doctrine will be law. It will be okay. So that means that state legislators can uh, get away with shenanigans like gerrymandering, redistricting in a way to hurt your opponent's political party. So this is worrying a lot of people, understandably. Um, you know, also you've got the worry that what about the electoral college for presidential elections? We saw lots of issues that, you know, with, in 2020, you had certain states that where there was a lot of state legislatures, members of state legislatures that said, no, we, I don't care what our citizens voted or how they voted. We need to override that. Um, if North Carolina wins this case, then you might see circumstances where Citizens, the majority of citizens in the state will vote for one president, but the state legislator, the state legislature will say, mm, nah, we're going to go with the other person. We like them better. And we're going to override what the majority of our citizens said. That to me is definitely uh, of concern. So, uh, you know, obviously there could be federal legislation that um, in reaction to this to make to make sure that doesn't happen. But that would also be fought in courts. And so you might see it even like strengthened because of other cases in the future. So that's, I'm trying to simplify this, but that's essentially my interpretation of it. Um, yeah, somebody is saying like the end of democracy. I mean, a lot of times uh, we kind of jump to these worst case scenarios, but it, we need to be aware of this. We need to put pressure on... Uh, our politicians to raise awareness about this because I know the Supreme Court is not supposed to be, you know, they're supposed to be immune to to public percept or public opinion. Why not put the pressure on them? Because um, this could be a very damaging. Oh, it says right here on the even on the Wikipedia page, Morby Harper is expected to have a significant impact on future elections in the United States should the court support the independent state legislature doctrine. Uh, and it, oh yeah, that's something else I didn't mention. Three of the justices have have expressed support for the uh, for the state legislature doctrine in the past. Thomas, of course, but also um, Alito and Gorsuch. Oh, Gorsuch, no, oh, no, no, you're wrong on this one, buddy. Um, so yeah, that's that's alarming. I don't think John Roberts would side with them. I don't. Obviously, we don't know about Barrett. So. Uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Um, and maybe Gorsuch will have like, it doesn't mean just because he expressed support for it in the past doesn't mean he will in the future. So we shouldn't just make the assumption. Thomas probably, yeah. Uh, Lito, even him, you never know. It's it's something that we need to be concerned about. I wouldn't automatically assume that it's the end of democracy, but spread the word about it. 
I understand Hillary won the popular vote, but anyone who voted for Trump should have known better, especially if those individuals are strongly against overturning Roe v. Wade. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, yeah, I mean, they even if they were secretive about it, the justices, like a lot of people shouldn't have been surprised that they would they would do this, even though many were surprised. <clears throat> EC interstate compact would contradict votes too. Um, oh yeah, yeah, it could potentially. If you don't know what the interstate compact is, um, it's a way to circumvent the electoral college by saying, like, if a state, uh, the state will basically give the electoral votes its electoral votes to whoever won the popular vote nationwide. So say, like, if Maryland, like, the, if the majority of residents in Maryland voted for candidates A, but then um, the who won the popular vote was candidate B. So that means under the interstate compact, uh, they would have to give their vote, the electoral votes to candidate B, despite the majority of people in their own state voting for candidate A. Yeah, that, that would definitely make a lot of people mad. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stick around for some prep from questions. I apologize if any of this was like confusing because this is um, not one of my Supreme Court beliefs videos. Uh, I can't break it down simply because like, you know, this is just all off the top of my head. <laughs> and a lot of these cases, I'm, I, you know, I'm new to them as well, but I just want you to be aware of all these cases. Oh, thank you very much. BMAC XX, like the uh, picture too. All right. Thanks for being here, everyone. Great discussion in the chat before the stream started, too. I was I was kind of paying attention to it. Tyler, thank you. Would you ever consider making a video on the U.S. nearly 20-year occupation of Haiti? I think it is a very little known event in the U.S. history in U.S. history and foreign policy. Keep up the great content. Thank you so much, Tyler. I agree with you. I don't even know much about it. So if anything, I would make this video like as an excuse to learn about it on my own, research it. So yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. There, there's Imperium Magistrate again. You know, oh, uh, you know, Bob LaFollette praised the USSR, right? Well, that, a lot of politicians praise USSR um, in the 1920s. You, you, you know that La Follette died in, in uh, 1925, right? Like, you know, that, that's before anybody knew about what Stalin was doing. So, or really what socialism in an authorian state look like. Um, if you think, if you're implying that La Follette liked authoritarianism, then you don't know what you're talking about. No offense, but you need to like really research what authoritarianism, the difference between authoritarianism and communism is they're not the same thing. Uh, okay. Crap. Sorry. I'm not very good at scrolling here. I keep scrolling too fast. Insert alias here. I apologize if you answered this question earlier, but what are your thoughts on court packing and or term limits? Um, great question. I did say, yeah, I actually, in my, my top 10 proposed amendments video, I actually talk about this. I, I do think that term limits for Supreme Court justices is a good idea, as long as it's probably at least 20 years, maybe 25. Um, court packing, um, that's something that if, Congress were to expand the number of members of the, of the Supreme Court, which they have in the past, by the way. There hasn't always been nine. Sometimes there's been less. Sometimes there's been more. They haven't changed it for a long time, since the 1800s. Uh, but if they do that, which I'm a fan of, probably make it 15, and it needs to be over a long period of time. And it can't take effect until after the current president is out of office. That, that's my only condition there. So, like, you know... Uh, FDR was on the right track when he suggested that, but I think how you do it is really important because you don't want to like 
give the current president all this extra power. That's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, great question, though. Questions. Steve D., thank you. NY State, New York State made it a requirement after Bruin for applicants to give. Oh, this is one of the cases I brought up earlier. For uh, applicants to give police access to their social media accounts for gun carry permits. <laughs> Thoughts. Ooh, this is a uh, interest. So this is their way around it, huh? Or this is something else that they can do to kind of. I don't like that. I don't like it. <laughs> uh, my, my first impulse, I don't know much about this, but uh, my first impulse is like, I don't like it. BMAC again. Thank you. Uh, I guess maybe you meant to ask a question earlier, so sorry that didn't work out. But uh, do you have an opinion on the case that said evidence proving a prisoner's innocence didn't warrant an overturning of their sentence? Um, let me read that again. Do you have an opinion on the case that said evidence proving? Oh, um, I think generally there should be as many opportunities as possible. If there's like somebody who's found guilty, um, like somebody like, especially in the past before we had all the, the modern technology with, um, improved evidence with DNA and stuff like that, uh, there, it should be easy for them to get another trial, like, um, to overturn their sentence. Um, that should be an easier process. It's way too difficult currently, in my opinion. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that issue up. That's something that's not brought up enough. If you're just now joining me, I have a new episode of Supreme Court Briefs coming out on Friday. The case is um, about, it's Castle Rock v. Gonzalez, the case about the uh, um, restraining order that the police of Castle Rock did not enforce that led to the deaths of three innocent children. Jose Vela, thank you. What do you think can be done about these anti-democratic decisions and politicians like those in the GOP? <laughs> Uh, you know, not all the GOP is bad, but I will say that there are, there's an active group um, within the Republican party that definitely is okay with, um, getting rid of, of, uh, protections, voting protections, because it does, they feel like it benefits their party. And I think it actually, it does because you look at the majority of the, uh, of the United States, most Americans, um, generally speaking, kind of side more on issues with the Democratic Party. I have problems with the Democrat Party. I mean, don't get me wrong. They've failed in many ways, especially in recent years. Um, but if you took, especially looking at economic and social issues, most Americans tend to side with um, Democrats. Um, but that said, um, you know, they are underrepresented. Uh, Republicans are overrepresented because of gerrymandering, but also um, the Senate. The way the, sen the Senate is in place, most of the smaller states are uh, Republican-led states. So um, now what can be done? Uh, get rid of gerrymandering. And it, it's not probably going to happen to the Supreme Court. So you need to elect politicians in, in Congress to, to get rid of gerrymandering. Um, it's not going to happen at the state level. It has to be federal. Um, you also need to, I think in some way, you got to reform the, how Congress represents us. So you need to increase the number of representatives in the House of Representatives. You need to have ranked choice voting or some other, like star voting is my favorite. Uh, or, or even a parliamentary system could be uh, added if you amend the Constitution someday something to make it so that we are better represented so you don't have people in congress that are so out of touch with their constituents that the constituents are just almost hopeless in many ways that's how many americans are right now they feel like their voice is never heard <clears throat> oh yeah there i mean it, it can be yeah like if i've criticized the soviet union um, and I mean, like if you research a lot of time, I mean, you could say the same thing about, um, like fascism in, in some way. I mean, fascism and, and often embraces capitalism markets, but you still see, um, cronyism and authoritarianism 
is very kind of like, I mean, just look at many fascist states. All right. Your thoughts on Bush basically admitting accidentally to being a war criminal a few weeks ago. He was at an event calling out Putin for Ukraine and misspoke and said Iraq, then said Iraq too. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know about this, just Google it. He was talking about um, Russia invading Ukraine. And it was a horrible thing that Russia was doing that. Um, and he misspoke and it was like a Freudian slip. Many say that it was like, oh, like invading Iraq, which is what the United States did, like invade a sovereign nation, just take it over in, in the name of ending some kind of injustice. Uh, and in the process, like killing hundreds of thousands of innocent people. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think he admitted he was a war criminal. Uh, I think a lot of times when we, it's easy just to label presidents war criminals. You could technically say every president since, uh, gosh, going way back, even back to Franklin Roosevelt or before that, were technically war criminals because innocent people died. And that's what happens during war. Um, however, yeah, I think that Bush does feel guilty. George W. Bush, I think, does feel a little bit of remorse for how things went down in Iraq. Um, I think he's a good person who has realized over time that things did not go as he envisioned and that he would have really hoped that not so many innocent people, especially looking at what happened afterwards, the power vacuum that was created in Iraq, the devastation that was that occurred because of that's directly linked to the American invasion of the country and uh, ISIS seizing that power vacuum um, as a result of the um, Iraq war and then the United States leaving, which we can stay there forever. Um, yeah, I think he does have remorse. I really do. Nick, thank you. You should do a stream of you, of you calling the Supreme Court justices. I'm sure they'll answer. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't think they would. I don't even know how to call them. It's not like the, the House of Representatives and Senate where the, all the numbers are listed publicly and anybody can do it. Uh, but yeah, that's a fun thought. <laughs> Thank you for the donation, left and cut. Mosin, would you consider making an objective clip about Noam Chomsky? I looked but haven't seen nothing in your channel. Please, please do one. I would be so happy to see your thoughts about Chomsky products. I, um, if you look at Chomsky, he, uh, and he's kind of like, reached le legendary status at this point. A lot of people admire him, but also he has some pretty harsh critics as well. I mean, he still is in the, the zeitgeist somehow, even though he's like 90, I think. He's old, but uh, he's still there mentally. I think he's a pretty important figure in, in modern American politics. Um, I think uh, if you look at his uh, political books, they're all like really... Um, at the very least informative. I don't always agree with him personally, but I, I agree with him a lot on foreign policy, except he kind of had a bad tick recently about Ukraine. But but no, I think it, it would be interesting to make a video about him. I, I, there are others I, I would rather make a video about first. Like, I really want to make a video about Mark Twain. I think that he, it's overdue. Like, I think there needs to be... Mark Twain was just fascinating and there's not enough good videos about him like there's this one documentary i found from the 90s and was like it's time to update this <laughs> a remorseful war criminal is still a war criminal yeah i mean as president of the united states it's difficult not to be a war criminal if you think about it because of our war apparatus, our military industrial complex, which I'm going to make a video about as well. Um, we are the world's police. We are the world's largest military by far. We have military bases in more than 100 countries. We uh, send our troops every edge of the globe. Um, you know, to throw a president in there as commander in chief and expect them not to like I mean, they're in charge. They they take responsibility, but I think a lot of stuff though gets blamed on them, and it's not in their control as we think it is. It's easy to blame, but I think we need to. I think it's more productive um, to reform the system. 
So, yeah, I mean, technically, yeah, you could say he's a war criminal for sure, but I think that's oversimplifying it and ignoring the larger systemic problems. Felipe, thank you. Opinion on diminished focus on well-regulated militia within the Second Amendment. Maybe a video on how this focus has diminished over time. Yeah, definitely. That was uh, the Heller v. D.C. Supreme Court case addressed this as well. Um, also, the Supreme Court has not said much about the Second Amendment, actually. In, in fact, in recent years, they've tackled it more than they ever did before the 21st century. Like they only, I think there was only like three or four Second Amendment, major Second Amendment cases before D.C. v. Heller. But yeah, like uh, the, the well-regulated militia part, I mean, they've chosen to um, separate that. So that's largely driven by interpretations by the court over the years. And now it's just all about like, Ever since, especially DCV Heller, the emphasis is on um, bearing arms as a way for self-defense. So the well-regulated militia is like, okay, that's an afterthought, which is interesting because you can interpret that as it being part of the <laughs> the same, um, you know, the right to bear arms. You mentioned NRA influence. I think the NRA influence is, is part of like part of the reason, but honestly, I think that's overstated a little bit. I think the NRA doesn't have as much influence as we think. It's more just the culture of our entire country. Don't forget, we were founded on um, a lot of it. I mean, think about how the Revolutionary War got started. The British were, they were seizing weapons. They went to go to take weapons from citizens. And then that's when <laughs> Lexington and Concord happen. Uh, so it's a big part of American culture. That fat man too. What do you think are the odds of the National Firearms Act getting overturned? Yeah, I don't know much about it. Uh, you said I've seen some people argue that the New York ruling provides some precedent. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the case we were mentioning earlier. Um, so I honestly, I need to, I need to research this more. I yeah, I don't know. I need to I need to research this more. I don't want to comment on something I don't know a whole lot about, but you brought up something for me to check out. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's getting hot in here. If you if you're just now joining, I, I am wearing a full robe here. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. We'll uh, we'll do another 15 minutes here. So blue regard, whether it is capitalism, socialism, communism, syndicalism, etc. They're all their economic ideas shouldn't be used to ascribe a government's tyranny. I agree with that for sure. Well put. I think that, um, you know, just a reminder that a lot, when we talk about these ideas, uh, we oftentimes are like envisioning a utopian paradise <laughs> when in reality, nothing is that simple. We have mixed economies around the world. There's no purely communist states. Even North Korea tries desperately to be that way, but black markets sneak in and, uh, that's how they have that nice stuff in Pyongyang. And uh, yeah, on the flip side, capital, like for those who say, oh, we have such a free market here in this country, blah, blah, blah. Now you don't. Now you don't. A lot of the uh, inventions, the patents are uh, from government, those that are working within government. So uh, I think the bottom line is we, we need to, whenever we talk about these economic ideals, like we need to separate it from political realities um, that that's a start, but also, yeah, government's tyranny, like the whole libertarian argument of generally we want to shift the power to the people. You want to shift, shift it to local areas versus like top down. I get that. I totally get that. I mean, who wouldn't be sympathetic towards Robert McNamara? <laughs> I'm sure he manages to be in on war with the best of intentions. Yeah, I mean, but he's another one who he would just like George W. Bush now. Like he, he, you could tell he felt regret later in life. That's why he did that whole documentary. If you haven't seen it, by the way, it's excellent. It's called The Fog of War. Uh, I believe it came out in 1999 or somewhere around then. It's a documentary in which Robert McNamara is the main star. He was the Secretary of Defense under um, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And a big reason why things escalated in Vietnam. And uh, in that documentary, he famously admits that the Gulf of Tonkin incident, parts of it were completely fabricated, which means, I mean, think about this. Tens of thousands of, of American soldiers, most of them poor, 
died based on a lie because this lie was just was the justification for escalating the war in Vietnam. So you need to understand that, you know, even if your intentions at the time are supposedly noble, your decisions can lead to innocent people dying. And that's not, I'm talking about American soldiers. What about all the innocent civilians in Vietnam and Cambodia and around, like, still to this day, suffering the consequences of that war? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's tough. I mean, look at Henry Kissinger. He's getting, he's, gets, he's called a war criminal. Uh, by the way, he's still alive. Did you know that Henry Kissinger is still kicking it? Uh, <laughs> he is still considered, many don't like him because of the, the decisions that he influenced and he made that directly or indirectly led to the deaths of innocent people. I think it's not easy being in those positions, um, but I understand why folks demonize these secretaries of state and defense and presidents that when you see all these innocent people die full ha de papel as an european i uh, i can't understand the need to have guns yeah i don't agree nor disagree it's just that it's a very american thing you're right about that and it doesn't even play a factor in european daily life culture that is true that's a very good astute observation there No, oh, thank you. <laughs> Got the old graduation gown. I've graduated many times. I have three degrees. It's, it's ridiculous. Okay. How, how much control do you have over the curriculum for the classes you teach? And what are some reforms you think are beneficial for public schools? It depends on the class, but uh, if you work in a, like I used to work in a bigger school district that, um, was more hands-on and they laid out every single thing you had to teach. So I had less freedom. However, jump ahead to when I started an economics class at, um, the high school I worked at later, that was a small town high school, more rural. Um, I had more control, like the state standards are more broad. Um, they give you a list of concepts and key terms and certain targets you need to hit but how you got to those, um, they gave me some freedom. So it was kind of nice because I could, you know, I could use real life examples that were more relevant to these kids or maybe something I was more passionate about. So uh, I think the smaller districts, there's a little bit more freedom. The bigger districts, like in the bigger cities, there's a little bit less freedom for because it's more micromanaged. But overall, um, remember, teachers don't create the standards. Um, school boards do. And so district school boards, but also state school boards, mostly state school boards. They're the ones. So if you're really worried about like all these parents freaking out about critical race theory, even though they don't know what it is, they're, they're scared of it. Um, they're going to these local school districts. But really, if they want to direct their attention to the state school boards, that's probably better directed. Um, you know, and they really need to like look at the standards. They need to read them. I don't, I don't think a lot of the parents read what actually the standards are. They're, they're out there. They're easily available or widely available, easy to get. You can download a PDF like that. Paulo de Carvalho. Have you ever thought about releasing all your research? Oh, no. Yeah. I list all my sources. Um, every single video I release, I have a list of sources, which means those are all pages I visit for research for my videos. Um, I, it's all there. <laughs> Just go, go back and check. Now, maybe my earliest videos, like from 2013 or 2014, uh, I don't know if I have links there, but I started doing it many, many years ago. So you can see every site I go. It's not like I just pulled the stuff out of my butt. Actually, back in the day, I used to rely on textbooks, like when I was in like the early days. Um, but I also have a video about textbooks and we know the problem with school test textbooks sometimes. Kissinger is a reason why 3 million died in my fatherland of Bangladesh. Yeah, see, stuff like that. That's why Kissinger is hated by so many because of stuff like that. Thanks for bringing that up. I'm sorry that, about that. Uh, could Jesse Ventura win in 2024? I don't think so. I love Jesse Ventura. <laughs> like, But he's just not... If, if, this, if this was Jesse Ventura in 
2002, yes, but I think he's past his prime, and a lot of people have no idea who he is. But yeah, you should check out Jesse Ventura. He's a cool dude. Oh, thank you. I like you. Uh, you know what? Screw it. I love you too. Thank you, Dak Shorts. We can use the L word here. Thank you very much. You guys are all really nice. Oh, uh, Paulo is correcting. I'm sorry. I more so meant in a master document like format. Oh, okay. Um, maybe I could pay someone to do that. <laughs> Hey, the main thing is, if you're, I know you're here for the, I mean, this is a Supreme Court stream. Oyez.com, O-Y-E-Z.com. That's my main source for Supreme Court briefs, my Supreme Court briefs episodes. Um, also, uh, Cornell has a great law site that I go to. Even my local college that's nearby UMKC, their um, website's great. So, I tend to visit the same sites for my Supreme Court briefs videos, um, but I would always start with oyez.com. Oyez.com. It's O-Y-E-Z.com. I always want to pronounce the Z. I think you just go Oye. Okay. Oh, no. What was your super chat? Oh, no. What was it? Uh, here, just say it again, and, and I'll, I'll find it, okay? Just say it again, and I'll find it. Greetings from Utah. I'm currently in my junior year of university as a history major. I just want to let you know that you made American history more exciting for me. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Dawson. Thank you, Dawson. I really appreciate that. That I, you know, these kind words are really um, especially needed now when I just released a video about uh, white nationalism, <laughs> and uh, I'm getting uh, brigaded quite a bit on my on that video. So I appreciate the kind words. Um, Oh, Mr. Terry's here. Yes. Oh, uh, yes, you can crash on my couch. In fact, I have a, I have an air mattress. That's how like, <laughs> that's how um, advanced we are here in the beat household. But thank you for the kind words. Um, trying to find the other one. The uh, the guy that got I didn't see his super chat, but yeah. Oh well. Uh, Chaos Phoenix Seven. The best way to improve a country is election reform. Ah, oh, yes, I know, right? That's what I'm going to do when I call the House of Representatives. When I'm calling every member of the House of Representatives, it's going to be about voting reform and something really simple, making Election Day a holiday. That's a starting point. And I think Republicans and Democrats agree, mostly. So if we can start there, start something simple, just make it a little easier for folks to vote, then I think you can. all the other issues that we complain about can later be resolved. Um, but by, oh, I didn't read your whole thing here. I, okay. But by definition, our current election system benefits our elected officials. How do we get election reform when our politicians will, will oppose it? Okay. Yeah. So you start out by, I mean, voting turnout right now is, especially for midterm elections, is very low. Let's actually, let's look at the, let's look at the voting turnout 2020 midterm. According to Fair Vote, which I'm a big fan of here, um, so that's that's a presidential elections. Um, what about what about midterm? Statista, Statista has this. Uh, sure, why not? Cookies. Okay. So midterm elections. So voting turnout, and this is for 2018. So in the 2018 um, midterm elections, 50% of registered voters voted. If we just get that up to 60 or 70%, you're going to see more reforms. You will. You just, you need to convince all of your friends to vote. You need to convince everybody, you know, to vote them sitting at home, them not voting is not a protest. It's not doing anything. No one is hearing them. They need to be heard. There are so many apathetic voters or they're non-voters. Um, I think that's the starting point. Then from there, you get voting reform. Once you finally get a majority of some sort to that's willing to reform, to end gerrymandering, 
to um, end voter suppression. Once you do all that, oh, and also campaign finance reform. Once you do all that, then you can start to make laws on other stuff. <laughs> you can get rid of the filibuster, for example, which the filibuster is, in my opinion, uh, well, the, I should say um, the silent filibuster is really harmful. The, the talking filibuster, I have no problem with. Uh, Shelby, yeah, hey, uh, thanks for all your support over the years. Um, I, no, not really. <laughs> I don't, uh, actually, sometimes friends will just do it for me. Sometimes I get free help with research, um, but I, I might consider, actually, if I were to hire someone, um, it would be first a fact checker and then next an animator. I have, like on my last video, I had somebody help me. Um, I was lucky to have somebody help me with the animations. That's why they were so good. So, um, but yeah, those are. Okay. Kissinger is the last surviving member of the Nixon administration. Yep. Oh, thank you so much, Brandon. Great suggestion there. Please clap. I love that. Oh, you got Prince there. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm going the other direction. Um, if I missed your super chat, let me know. I'll try to make up for it. I'm going to be wrapping this up here in, uh, shortly. Just want to make sure I cut all the super chats because you're you're donating money, and I appreciate that. Eric, I recognize Eric. He's been critical of the past, and I appreciate that. Do you believe it's important to have a secure southern border? Um, yes, I do. Um, you know, it's, I don't think a wall is effective. I think it's better to actually have, um, instead of our soldiers, like guarding borders around the world, you should bring our soldiers home and have them there. Uh, the wall is not as effective. People just climb walls. So, uh, and do you think the, the way the current administration has run the border acceptable? I mean, it's, he's, Biden is mostly running the border the same way as, um, Trump. There's a few small changes. But generally, if you pay attention, it's not really that. Now, what's happening, though, are there's more there's more illegal immigration. And so because of that, it looks worse. But I think it's better to have I mean, the wall. Don't ever forget. This is really important, Eric and everyone, that the vast majority of people that are illegal immigrants in the United States simply overstay their green cards or visa. They they got here legally originally and they just stay here. So that's, I mean, yeah, <laughs> uh, you're not going to, if you want to really look at reforming immigration, you need to address that. You can't just put up a wall as a simple solution and think that's going to solve all the problems. That's, that's a little, frankly, a little naive. <clears throat> Running for uh, Maryland, House District 8, Democrat primary, support ranked choice voting. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for, uh, good luck on your, uh, your run. It's good to see some of my viewers, uh, running for public office. Good for you. Good for you. Um, okay. Chris, the social and political division we have now seems historic. When is the last time tensions were so high? I actually answered this on another another live stream, but um, we have only had this much tension as far as like political divisions in the United States in the years preceding the Civil War. I sincerely mean that. We have not seen this division like we are living in the turbulent 20s, as I call them. But also this goes back really to 2010 even technically back to 2000, um, it's a exceptionally divisive time. That's why it's scary, a scary time to live through. So only the 1840s and 50s, I think, were more divisive, which obviously we know what happened with that, a civil war. So, but I think things are slowly getting better a little bit. I try to be optimistic. <laughs> okay, uh, I think I got all, all the... Uh, Oh, Mosin. Uh, where'd you at, Mosin? Uh, okay, hold on. I lost it. 
There you are. Who do you think will make it better progressive candidate who has higher viability to win? Please rank one to five. And who do you think should run in 24, even if Biden runs? Also DeSantis or Trump. Um, first of all, let me just say, I I think uh, Ron DeSantis would be a better candidate than Trump. I think Trump's too tainted at this point. Um, I mean, the guy could end up facing legal, legal consequences here soon. Um, so I think members of his cults need to wake up and say, it's time to explore a different candidate. On the Democratic side, um, the ones I like tend to not be nominated. <laughs> uh, I really like Katie Porter a lot. Um, I doubt she ever has a chance. Um, somebody floated the idea of Jon Stewart running in an article yesterday, and I was like, you know what? Why not? If you're going to have Trump run again, why not Jon Stewart? I mean, I know, obviously, we shouldn't have entertainers being our priority for who runs, but um, but generally speaking, I'm... You know, I'm not going to be, I understand like the need, like we want someone more moderate. Like there's a guy, uh, what's his name from North Carolina. There's a democratic uh, politician that's getting, somebody mentioned him in the comments. He's getting a lot of, I uh, don't know much about him, but apparently he would be like a good moderate on that side to run. So, all right. I think I caught up on, oh, okay. Sorry. I skipped you Elmo. You forgot what you asked. Okay, here's the deal. Elmo, I want you to remember what you asked later, maybe. <laughs> and then if you remember, I'll come back in the comment section. Go to the comments and type it in the comments, okay? And then I'll, I will respond in the comments. Um, yeah, I, hey, I want to thank you all for watching. Um, you know what? Like... Even those of you who are critical of me, you are so respectful and amazing, and I love you. And uh, thanks for watching, putting up with me. Uh, don't forget that I'm always changing my mind on things, even these Supreme Court decisions. If you missed this, the beginning of this um, stream, uh, what happened was I looked at the major Supreme Court decisions of the 2021-2022 term. There were a lot of them. Many of them are consequential. And I said at the beginning, essentially, this is one of the most consequential Supreme Courts we've ever had in American history. The only other two uh, courts that I think have been more consequential are obviously the Marshall Court, John Marshall, Lil John, and the Earl Warren Court. So the current court we have right now, John Roberts, the John Roberts Court, will be mentioned for years to come um, in the history books. Well, I don't know if history books will exist, but you know what I mean. They'll be talking about them for years to come because it's a very consequential court, uh, for better or for worse. Um, obviously, my bias leans towards for worse because of what I stated earlier, generally speaking. But um, I will defend the Supreme Court day in, day out. I still think it's a fine group of justices overall. Some of them worry me, but overall... Um, the Supreme Court is, uh, they try to interpret the Constitution as best as they can for the benefit of the country. I will try to defend them. It's been very hard. June was rough, but keep an eye on them. And remember, um, I know we can't vote for the Supreme Court justices, but if you don't like how they're deciding right now, um, you can vote for local just judges who may someday end up on the Supreme Court. You also can vote for legislators at the local level and the national level who are willing to reform the courts or especially the Supreme Court at the federal level. Um, so keep that in mind. Oh, hey, Emperor Tiger Star joined up. Hey, packing the court is controversial. What about depacking the five like how it originally was? <laughs> That's another great idea. Um, and so in that case, I think you would maybe you could complement that with term limits like or age limits or something. Not, I hate to say age limits. That's, I don't know. I'm kind of against that actually, but you know, like, yeah, let's say term limits. You could couple it with that. And then so you're, you have to retire after this many years and then that, until you shrink it down to five, why not? And then that will be a, that way. The pro, it, that way it's not all of a sudden, Hey, you know, I could be down with that. Oh, we got another super chat here. Okay. Alien. Uh, some say the Kennedy's, wouldn't approve of the now Democratic Party, would he? Um, okay, so remember historical relativism. Also remember if if John F. Kennedy 
was, I'm assuming you're talking about John Kennedy, not any of the other Kennedys. Um, if he was placed, if, like, if he was alive today, he was a very intelligent man. I think he would change his mind on a lot of things. That's, I would say the same thing about George Washington. I think we are products of our environment. And I think when we talk, people always criticize me, like, why do you focus so much on character in terms of leadership? Well, character is what makes leaders good. And so if you are willing to learn new information, you're curious, which all the good presidents were curious. They kept changing their minds when they were given new information. Then you are going to probably, presumably, if you're around today, you're going to change your minds on some things. And so I think that Kennedy, I don't know if he would be, I think he would mostly still be okay with the Democratic Party, but not on all of it, for sure. Um, but I think that's kind of, so people who tend to say that, that he wouldn't approve of today's Democratic Party, tend to be very partisan. <laughs> so, all right. Oh, I got another one. Thank you. Victoria, thank you. I say pack the court. We need to balance things. Yeah, but you know, a lot of people would be upset if we did that. Uh, I just don't think that's the right. If you do that, you would have to do it over a long period of time. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you for all the support. Thanks for uh, the great conversation. Thanks for listening. Uh, and again, new episode of Supreme Court Briefs on Friday. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And uh, stay safe out there. Take care.